Okay, here's a review on our first essential skill for this year in Integrated 3, and it's going to be functions. Now, functions is a very large category and incorporates a lot of different things. I'm only going to focus on a few things this video. So, evaluating functions is one of them. Um, operations between functions, uh, creating a complete graph, and then with that complete graph, being able to identify all pertinent characteristics of a given function. So, like domain, range, increasing, decreasing, all that type of stuff. So on this first one, we're going to talk about uh, evaluating functions themselves. So you see I already have a couple functions, f, g, and h. And all we're going to do is just evaluate them using some specific numbers, whether that number is an input value or it's the result, so our output value. So here we go. We have got f of 3. Notice that the 3 is in the exact same location in the notation as the x is. So everywhere I see an x, I'm going to cram a 3 in. So this is going to be 7, there's the x, and inside the x is where we're going to put in the number that we're supposed to be plugging in. Now from here we just go ahead and do the math. So we get 21 minus 3, and that gives us 18. So now I know that f of 3 is 18. Now just to be clear, basically what you're being told here is that there is an ordered pair that is 3 comma 18 on the graph itself. That's all that notation means. Okay, so let's move on to number 2. Uh, number 2, this one's a little bit different. Notice that the g of x is given to you. Now the g of x is the end result, so what is your output value? So in this case, everywhere I see a g of x, in the equation I'm going to put a 5. So there's where my g of x would be, equals, and then the rest of the g of x equation, which is root 9x minus 1. So I'm going to go ahead and put 5 in there. And at this point, I'm trying to solve for x. So to get rid of the square root, I'm going to square both sides. That gives me 25. Square and the square root cancel on the right-hand side. Add the 1 over to the other side. That gives me 26, 9x. I'm going to divide both sides. And I'm going to get x is equal to 26 over 9. If I could simplify it, I would. So basically what this says is that g of something is going to be 5. Well, the something is the 26 over 9 that we just found. So again, much like the first one, uh, we have an x comma y, in this case 26 over 9 comma 5. Okay, moving on, same thing with 3. Notice that we have what h of x is equal to, so I'm going to where my h of x is, open a set of parentheses, and then copy down the rest of the equation, so x squared minus 8x plus 14. Okay. And once we have that, I'm going to go ahead and put my 10 in where it belongs. Okay, at this point, we have an x squared and x and an equal sign. Yeah, we have some numbers floating around as well, but it's those three things, x squared, x, and equals. As soon as you have x squared, x, and equals, you have three choices. You've got quadratic formula, completing the square, and factoring. Um, I normally like to try to factor first if it's possible. It may not be if it's possible, though. So I'd minus the 10 over to the other side to get equals 0. Once I do that, I get x squared minus 8x minus this is going to give me 4. This is factorable, So there's no way I can multiply to 4x squared and get a negative 8x when I add. So at this point in time, you have to decide if you're going to do quadratic formula, if you're going to do completing the square. I'm a big fan of completing the square, so I'm going to go ahead and do it that way. So I'm going to move the 4 back over, so I want to kind of ignore it. I'm going to find the number that would complete the square here if I drew one. So if I go off to the side, do a quick little, I'm going to have an x squared. The negative 8x gets split in half, so negative 4x, negative 4x. Okay, the only number that's actually going to make that work is 16. So 16 is my magic number. I'm going to add 16 to the left, and I'm going to add 16 to the right, so both sides. Then... If I go ahead and add these up, that's going to give me a 12. On the right-hand side, I want to go back and factor. So if I factor, I'm going to get x minus 4 and then x minus 4, which it should match because it is a square. So it's going to give me x minus 4 quantity squared. I'm going to square root both sides because I am trying to solve 4x. Don't forget, if you put a square root in, you have to put in the plus or minus. Um, so this is going to give me the square root, plus or minus square root of 12. Square and square root are going to cancel on that, so I'm going to get x minus 4. Last thing I need to do is add 4 to both sides. So if I do that, I like to put that value in front. It's going to be 4 plus or minus the square root of 12, which is equal to x. 
I don't know exactly what the square root of 12 is. I do know that it can be simplified, so I would go ahead and simplify it, and that gives me 2 root 3. So my answer is going to be 4 plus or minus 2 root 3. Okay, moving on to the last one on this page. So we've got h of negative 1. Notice that the negative 1 is in the location of the x value. So in this case, everywhere I see an x, I'm going to go ahead and open up a set of parentheses. And then everywhere I see an x, I'm going to cram a negative 1 in. So this is an input value. All right, so here this gives me 1. That's going to give me plus 8, and that's going to give me plus 14. All right, so it's going to be 9 plus 14, so that's 23. So this is telling me h of negative 1 is equal to 23. Okay, so that covers evaluating functions. Go ahead and move on to the next one. So in this case, we want to do some basic operations. So my recommendation to you is kind of plug in this stuff. Instead of trying to do all the math in your head, just in case um, you possibly uh, transpose numbers in your head when you do it, or if you add when you're supposed to be subtracting, whatever, it might be helpful to write it down. So in this case, I use parentheses whenever I plug the second function in, if it's addition or subtraction. I just think it makes it a little bit easier. In this case, since it's plus, it's really not going to affect anything. So I can just go ahead and combine like terms. So I'm going to get negative 2x minus 2. And that's it. I'm not going to do anything else to it. That's the statement. I've added the two functions together. I have my answer. Okay, moving on to number 2. Uh, now we're going to do a subtraction problem. Pay attention to the order in which the subtraction occurs. We know that the order in which you do subtraction does affect the answer. So like 7 minus 3 isn't the same as 3 minus 7. So just keep that in mind when you're doing this. Uh, plug in our f of x. Notice I'm using a set of parentheses again, especially for the second one. Um, and multiply, uh, excuse me, with subtraction for sure, because you're going to need to distribute this negative sign. So everything behind this is going to get that negative sign. So I'm going to flip the sign on the 6x. That's going to come a plus. I'm going to flip the sign on the 7. Then go ahead and combine like terms. So get a 10x minus 16. Again, that's my final answer. I'm not going to do anything else to it. Okay, moving on down here to the multiplication problem. This is stuff you guys spent a huge amount of time dealing with last year. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in my f of x, which was negative 6x plus 7. And since it is multiplication, I'm going to use parentheses around both of these guys. And then I'll get my 4x minus 9 plugged in as well. At this point, my recommendation to you is to draw the box. It's really worth your time and your energy to do so. It's... This is something you definitely don't want to make a silly mistake on just based off of the fact that we've spent so much time doing these problems. They should kind of be uh, easy points for you. But remember that the boxes are a nice tool. So go ahead and fill your stuff in. Watch your signs. Also make sure that you have X's when you're supposed to. And then after we've done that, go ahead and combine like terms. So we get a negative 24x squared, multiply. So add those two. I think that's going to give me an 82x, and then a minus 63, and that's kind of close. So I'll go ahead and box that one. So there's my answer on that. Okay, now on, on to the new guy. So with the division problem, we'll talk about later how to actually perform division with variables on the bottom and variables on the top. The types of problems that I'm giving you right now, there's really nothing else you can do with them other than write the fraction down and then just say what your variable can't be. So I'll put the g of x on the top, which is the 4x minus 9, and I'll put the f of x on the bottom, which is the negative 6x plus 7. Okay, we're halfway there. We only have a little bit more to go. When you have a variable in the bottom of a fraction, you have to think about the limitations of that variable. Uh, you, we are not allowed to ever have zero in the bottom of a fraction, and since there's a variable in the bottom, we have to make sure that we avoid any possibility of that turning into a zero. So I'm going to put a little comma here so I can finish this, and my variable is x, and I'm going to figure out what x is not allowed to be. So I'm going to do just a little bit of side work. I'm going to take the denominator itself only, I don't really care about the numerator at this point, and I'm going to figure out what makes it zero, because that's the bad number, that's the thing you're not allowed to plug in. Go ahead and minus the 7, and then solve by dividing. If I divide a negative by a negative, I know I'm going to get a positive. Basically, if I plug 7 sixths in for x into the bottom, I'm going to get a zero in the bottom, which is not acceptable. 
So my whole answer, the entire thing, is going to be this whole thing. It is the fraction, comma, and then say what the variable can't be. It's important to make sure that you say X here and not like T or R. Whatever the letter is is the letter that you need to use. Okay, moving on to the next one here, we have a little bit more stuff. So this goes along with the um, uh, stuff that you guys did back in Integrated too. So uh, do a couple obvious ones first. Um, I know the shape is definitely going to be a parabola just based off of the nature of the equation. I also know that parabolas that are y equals, you and I are going to talk about x equals this year, but y equals parabolas absolutely are functions. I also know that the domain is always going to be all real numbers for a parabola that is y equals, which means it either opens up or down. Um, I also know that these parabolas, or any parabolas, uh, have no asymptotes. They never will. Uh, increasing and decreasing range x-intercepts, y-intercepts, going to do a little bit of work. Not a huge amount, but a little bit. All right, so if I want to find my x-intercepts, well, to find x-intercepts, I'm going to plug in 0 for y. So I would do 0 equals x squared minus 3x plus 2. Uh, remember, you have an x squared, you have an x, you have an equal sign, so quadratic formula, factoring, completing the square. Well, I think this one's factorable, so I'm going to go ahead and factor it. So I've got x minus 2, x minus 1. Use zero product property. We know that x minus 2 equals 0 is an option. We also know that x minus 1 equals 0 is another option. So I'm going to go ahead and solve this. I get x equals 2 and I get x equals 1. All right. When you're doing x-intercepts, they're always points. So make sure that you write them as something comma 0. So I get 2 comma 0 and I get 1 comma 0. All right. My y-intercept, way easier. So with my y-intercept, I'm going to plug in 0 for all of my x's. So this is going to be f of x equals, and something beautiful happens. Everything that had an x attached to it turns into a 0. Ultimately, the only thing you should be left with is that plus 2 at the end, or whatever the constant is. That's going to be your y-intercept. Again, make sure that you write it like a point. Okay. Now, I think we have enough information to kind of get this graph going a little bit. So if I go over here... I'm going to have 1 comma 0, and then I've got 2 comma 0, and then I just came up with 0 comma 2. All right, so I've got some points. All right, now I want to find the vertex. Well, I know that the vertex is going to be dead center between the x-intercepts themselves. So you can either count in yourself or you can average them. So if I want to find the x value of the vertex, so if I start doing the vertex, I'm going to take the two x-intercepts and I'm going to average them. So that's going to give me 3 over 2, or 1 and a half. What's really nice about this is as soon as you find the x value of the vertex, you just found the line of symmetry. So just give it equals x because it's going to be a vertical line. So if we do line of symmetry, I know it's going to be x equals 3 halves. You could write it as 1.5, you can write it as 1.5, it's ultimately up to you. This also tells me back on my graph that I'm going to have like this kind of like invisible little line that's going to go right down the middle of this thing. Now because of that, I can use this idea of symmetry. If I look here, this point, so my green point here, my y-intercept, if I count over it is 1 unit, and then another half a unit to get to the line of symmetry. So it's one and a half away. It has to have a partner, so I'm going to go one and a half away on the other side. So there's a half from there and then a full one. So right there is another point. So I've got these two green points now that are also going to be on the parabola. All right, I need to finish finding the vertex. So, so far for the vertex, I have... Uh, three halves or one and a half, comma, something. I have to find the something. So if you know an x value and you have an equation, you just plug it in so that you can find the y value. So I would do y is equal to, back up in my equation, everywhere I have an x, I'm going to plug a three halves in, or I'm going to plug in one and a half or 1.5, however you want to write it. It's ultimately up to you. So I'll go ahead and plug that in. And I'm just going to go ahead and do the work. So now, whether you are a decimal person or a fraction person, it's ultimately up to you. 
I know that I don't get a calculator on this, so I prefer to keep things in terms of fractions. So just getting a common denominator here so then I can easily add all of my stuff together. All right, so if I do 9 fourths minus 18 fourths, going to give me negative 9 fourths. Negative 9 fourths plus 8 fourths is negative 1 fourth. So there's my y value of my vertex, which go back and fill in. So you might be asking yourself, well, where exactly is that? It doesn't have to be exact. We know that negative one fourth is somewhere between zero and negative one, and that's actually closer to neg excuse me, closer to zero. So I would just go over to my point at back on my graph. I'm gonna go ahead and put it in red so we can see it. So I'll go back to here. So there's my three halves. I'm going to go down a half, and then I'm going to come up just a little bit, so not a huge amount. And that's going to be my vertex. And once I've done that, I should be able to sketch this thing. So go ahead and give it a nice smooth curve. Make sure it's not pointy. If it's pointy, you're actually graphing an absolute value, which is really not what's happening here. Okay, now that I have the graph, I should be able to answer some other things. So my range, well, based off of my picture, the lowest point that it's going to go is through the vertex itself. Remember range or y values, though. So I'm just going to go to the vertex, and I'm going to grab the y value of the vertex. Well, the y value of the vertex was negative 1 fourth. I prefer to use interval notation, so I would put a bracket on this guy because it does go through that point, comma. It is continuous, and the thing is pointing up forever. Remember, no brackets ever on infinity. We don't know the largest or smallest number in existence. We can just say we know that there's something out there. Okay, increasing and decreasing. When we talk about what's actually happening when we look at the graph and we think about tracing it from one side to the other. So if I come in from the left-hand side and I start with my pencil up where this blue mark is, if I traced the graph, I would actually be going down, which means while I'm going down, my graph is decreasing. So decreasing, coming in from the left-hand side, so negative infinity, until I am approaching the x value of the vertex. Negative infinity, so the beginning is negative infinity, up to as I get close to the x value of the vertex. So keep in mind that domain, mm, that's, uh, scratch that, that um, increasing and decreasing is always in terms of x itself. Okay, so immediately after the vertex, I'm back at my picture, immediately after the vertex in purple, now my pencil is going up. So that means that my graph is increasing. So immediately after the x value of the vertex at three halves, all the way to the right as far as I can go, my graph is increasing. Okay, hopefully that gives you a little bit of review before the test.